Hey, this is Scott Rolliter uh, with another clinic uh, here at Billiard Factory. I teach these every month, and uh, this time we're actually doing a reshoot. Um, last time we were unable to film it, so we're just kind of filming something from, from last month. So the previous clinic we talked about um, angles and angle rolls. We talked about tangent lines and 90 degree, 30 degree, 60 degree rolls, 45 degree rolls, things like that. This time I wanted to uh, kind of expand on that and talk about different types of shapes at the table. So we talked about uh, like the angles. Now I want to talk about different shapes like lines, um, a triangle, circles, squares, things that you can kind of visually see on the table as you're playing. So I want to kind of revisit uh, something that we talked about last time, was, which was the tangent line. Um, it is an important enough concept to go ahead and kind of revisit that briefly. I'm going to go ahead and use the projector for this. So I went over this last time, but I, again, when the cue ball, when the cue ball hits an object ball and the cue ball is sliding, so it has neither backward or forward roll on it, the cue ball is going to travel down the tangent line. So this is a good uh, graphical representation of that. So again, if my cue ball is over here, really anywhere over in this direction, when I hit this one ball, again with the stop shot, the cue ball is going to travel right down this tangent line. Once it hits that rail, it will then just continue to kind of come back out of the tangent line at a, at a kind of a V shape. So anywhere in here, as long as I can hit a stop shot where the ball's not um, rolling backwards or rolling forwards, it's going to follow that tangent line. So I'll just kind of show you real quick. Okay, so it's going to follow right down that line. Now again, if you have a little follow on it, a little draw on it, it's going to either go forward of that line or come back from that line. And we talked about that last time where the harder you hit the ball, the longer it travels down that line before it goes forward or before it comes back. So I just kind of wanted to show a quick um, visual representation of that tangent line to kind of wrap that up from, um, from the previous discussion. Okay, so the next concept I want to talk about is the concept of a shot line. So you can see right here I've got a line pointed straight to the eight ball. Uh, we, we basically want to, when we're playing nine ball especially, we want to run things in three ball patterns. So we're going to play, we're going to hit the first ball, make it, try to get shape on the second ball, but it's not good enough to just get shape on the second ball. We also need to get shape on the second ball in a way that we, that, that leads to, to position on the third ball. So I can easily make the seven ball and get into a wide variety of positions for the eight. But if I'm, if I want to play the eight in the side, I need to look at this shot line and determine which side of that shot line I want to be on. If I get on this side of the shot line, or if I get straight in, it's going to be very, it's going to be difficult to, very difficult to get on the nine, depending on exactly where the position is. Especially if I get like on the rail over here and I'm on the wrong side of the eight. To try to power that up and go three rails around the table is very difficult. And it's also leading to the short side of the nine, which is not ideal. But if I get a little bit on this side, even if I have a you know, pretty decent angle, I'm in much, much better shape. So again, if you're not paying attention to that concept, if I just hit this ball with a kind of a regular follow stroke, I could easily come up on the wrong side of the line like this. Now again, I could play the eight potentially for the corner or, or something too, but a lot of times this would be the, the angle you would try to play for. So instead, if you're aware of that shot line concept, you could put a little bit of inside English on this if needed, or, or just make sure you hit the ball to the proper part of the pocket, and make sure you come in like kind of towards this third diamond and stay on this side of the line. So that would look something like this. Okay, so coming in right toward the third diamond, now I've got a nice easy shot on the eight and very easy shape on the nine. All I have to do is just simply stun the ball up there a little bit and it's, it leads me very easy to the nine. The flip side of that, again, say I land over here, 
Now I have to either go around the table three rails and I'm going to end up being on the short side of the nine. Or I can go two rails this way and come up here. Or I can come straight up the table like that. I'll try to hit all three options for you. So you can see a lot of danger with that option. Speed control is very critical and you're always going to be pretty close to a scratch and if you come up a little short you might be coming directly into the nine ball. I probably would not choose that option from this particular uh, position but again if this was earlier in the rack and there were other balls on the table it could be the only option you have. So another option from here would just be a kind of a stun shot and again trying to hit this and ramping up on your speed and making sure there's no extra spin on the ball. You know again a little bit touchy could get a little close here could come straight up here tough Tough to, tough to do as accurately as that other shot that I showed. And another option you have from here is to use a little bit of inside English and come two rails, possibly even three. Okay, so to me that would probably be the option I would choose if I was wrong sided on the ball. However, if I overspin that with a little too much inside or underspin it, it would be possible to, again, bring the scratch into play here or possibly be coming up the table at the nine here. So as you become a better player, you have to know all those different routes. But I would much rather be cognizant of the shot line and be somewhere on this side where I can either do something like this and do a simple follow shot to get up there or do the stun shot that I hit earlier. So again, it's good to identify the shot line and pay attention to that on that second ball in the, in the three ball sequence. Here's another example with, uh, with a few more balls. So again, you'll see a lot of professional players or top players a lot of this becomes very intuitive and you don't really have to check it every single time. But the pro players and again the better players kind of have an instinct to know when they need to do a quick check. And sometimes you'll see players uh, walk around the table, they're very disciplined and they'll come around and they might even look at it like this from multiple sides. Uh, other times you'll see players do something like this and they'll do a quick check and then just come back and, and kind of settle for a second and then shoot the shot. One thing to guard against when you're when you're planning your runouts, I see a lot of my students do this, they rush things a little bit. So let's just say I want to playing from the seven to the eight here is kind of critical. If I get on this side of the shot line, then the cue ball leads me very nicely over to the eight. If I get on this side, I have to either go two rails around the table or back and forth across the table. So again, it's more complex. Now that's going to happen sometimes, but you don't want to plan for that. So if I'm trying to look at my shot line, again, I'll see some players come like this when they look and then they come here and they get right down right away and they, and they get ready to shoot. What I like to do, I like to come over here if I'm going to look at my line. And then I want to come over here and still set up, go through my whole routine give my give my eyes a chance to process the visual information that uh, that I just acquired before I just in such a hurry to get down on the shot. So from here again I'm going to shoot the six I'm going to try to be a little bit on this side of this line. Okay so I got I just got there and again straight in here is okay too because I can kind of draw back and I also want an angle on the eight <clears throat> to get over to the nine. The one thing I don't want on the eight is I don't want to be straight in like this because now I'm going to have to hit a force follow shot or some sort of a, a real hard shot or I may have to settle for a bank on the nine. So I definitely don't want to be straight in on the eight. 
So really now that I'm here on the seven, I got the ideal angle. So we just want to pull back a little bit. Okay, keep myself about two feet away and a nice angle. So from here, now it's a fairly easy job to basically hit this ball, a little bit of draw, maybe a little left English, and come down here for position on the nine. Okay, so now from here again, pretty nice uh, position to, to be playing on the nine. So again, don't, don't get too wrapped up when you're playing in a match about to, to look at every single shot line. There are some pro players that do that, and they do it quickly, and it's part of their routine. Uh, Ralph Suquet comes to mind. He walks around the table almost every single shot. But once he kind of plans in his mind what he wants to do, he gets down and shoots very, uh, you know, very quickly. Like I said, the, the biggest tip I can give you besides looking at the shot lines is to Make sure you take your time after you look at the shot line. Don't don't be in a hurry to rush into the shot. Still go through your pre-shot routine, take your practice strokes, all of that. Now I want to go into some of the concepts with um, triangles, basically, for position zones. So technically, uh, one, of the, um, one of the authors that I really like a lot is Phil Capel. And he has a lot of these types of diagrams in his book. I remember reading them probably 20 some years ago when I first got a, his first book that he came out with. And he really shows the position zones as kind of a modified triangle, right? There, there's kind of a flat zone here close to the ball. Um, that, that, so it's not a pure triangle, but I think for purposes of demonstration, it's, it's close enough. So again, if I look at this seven ball, and let's say I had, I had gotten to this point through a previous run, I would kind of like to be somewhere in this zone. So let's just say I'm right here. A lot of times people like to use uh, coasters or uh, paper plates or something like that as a representation of the position zone. And you can see here on the diagram, if I kind of have a circle in the ideal position zone, I'm really missing out on a large portion of what really is the true position zone. And you can see on the nine, same way. I'd like to be right here, but really if I'm up here or if I'm in these fringe areas of the triangle, I'm really okay. So I think expressing the position zones in, in terms of triangles is a better way of, of thinking about it and also approaching the position zones. Um, I've talked before on some of my previous clinics about position where, for instance, on this nine ball, I have a nice triangular position zone. I don't want to be coming into the zone this way. I'm coming across it, the side pockets here. I don't want to be coming across it this way. It's a very narrow zone. So my ideal way to get into this zone would be to be coming down the lawn side of the triangle because once I hit this outside edge of the triangle and really even a little before, I just have a little longer shot. But if I can come down this way, I basically have about two feet to land in to still have a decent shot on the nine, maybe even sometimes two and a half feet. So the better I can control my angle to be coming down that zone, and the more often I can do that, the more success I'm going to have in, in running out tables. If I'm constantly having to come in through the short side of the shot or through the skinny side of the triangle or coming across the zone where I'm only in the zone for maybe maybe uh, six to nine inches, um, it's just going to limit my ability to run out consistently because those that margin for error is going to catch up to me eventually. So again, in this example, I could be in a couple different positions on the seven, but let's just say I got a pretty good position like right here. If I'm coming down for the eight, I'm really just trying to get somewhere in here. On this particular um, sequence of shots, it's okay if I get straight on the eight because I can draw straight back towards this zone for the nine. If I'm a little bit on this side of straight in, I can play a one or two rail position to come down the zone. 
And if I'm on this side of the eight, um, I, I still have a good shot. I just have to be a little more careful how I approach the zone because of the side pocket and because I don't want to be coming in too close to the skinny part of the zone. So let's go ahead and try this one and see. Okay, so I landed a little bit on that side. Now again, keeping in mind this position zone, if I'm gonna be coming towards the side pocket, I wanna make sure that my speed is such that I don't hit, that I don't go into the side pocket. So whenever you have position like this where you're coming across the table and you might scratch, a good tip is to just really focus on your speed. If you get the angle a little wrong and you're a little high or you're a little low, that's okay. But if you can focus on your speed, let's say to come about right here, and again, the better the player, the more accurate you're going to be with that. But if you just think about it and don't try to hit the rail and bounce out, you can really eliminate uh, quite a few scratches here and there that otherwise um, would happen not paying attention to that. So. Okay, so you can see my speed was good. I was a little long because I was making sure I didn't get too close, but this is perfectly fine on the eight ball. I'm, I'm basically just, a, sorry, on the nine ball, I'm just a little bit behind where maybe the ideal would be about a bit of about two feet. Let's run those again. I'm going to see if I can get maybe on the other side a little bit. Okay. So now I got a really nice angle and now I have kind of a one or two rail shape. That's a little bit of personal preference. Um, I kind of like coming off this second rail because it slows the cue ball down a little bit more and it'll, it'll kind of come into the zone. So again, when I'm sitting here visualizing, I'm going to hit the ball with natural follow and I'm going to put spin on it if I feel I need the spin in order to help get me and you know kind of get over to the rail. If the natural follow angle is going to work, then I'll just go with that. On this particular shot, I probably need just a little bit of um, outside English, which is left English in this case, if I'm going to use follow. So I'm going to go ahead and do that. But you'll see that I can roll the ball real nicely from here and should be able to get good position. Okay, so you can see I used the two rails and I came right into the zone that I was looking for. Take the scratch out of the way, come down the lawn side of the position, everything's easy that way. So again, if you can pay attention to your angles ahead of time, you can just make your life a lot easier when you're running out as opposed to having to hit um, shots that are a lower, lower percentage. Here's another good example to show with the position zones. And I like this one because it really shows that on a lot of shots, there are a couple different ways to achieve what you're trying to do. So in this example, we're looking at the last four balls and I need to get from the six ball up to the seven. Now, if I had ball in hand, I would probably, normally I would say I would like to put the cue ball, let's say down here, hit the six, float toward this rail where the nine is, and then just kind of float up toward the seven. That would be one way of doing it. Obviously, I can't do that or wouldn't do that because the nine is there. And another way of doing it, of course, there's multiple ways, but another easy, simple way of doing it would be to have the cue ball up here at a nice angle and it basically hit the six in the corner and just kind of float up this line. Uh, if you got a little straighter, you could also draw out of the corner two rails. Uh, with the eight here, could be a little close depending on the angle, but that's another standard route to get up to the seven. So I show here that there's kind of a skinny triangle and a much fatter triangle. So if the five ball was on the table and you're playing shape on the six, you generally would try to play for the larger position zone. Now we all sometimes will go one or two or three rails toward the six and mismanage our speed or our angle and may end up on the short side. We may end up straight in, which is a big no-no. That's why there's a kind of a void here. You don't wanna be 
straight in, if you get close to straight in, especially if you get near the rail, it's very difficult to get up to the seven. And a lot of times you may have to settle for a longer shot or play safe. So I would like to be probably right about here. And my goal is going to be just to do a simple rolling ball shot, make the six, and just, again, focus on my speed. It just comes straight up the table. Now you can see here on the seven, I've actually got probably four zones I can get in. So I can play short side. You can see how small the position zones are. Or I can play on the lawn side, which would be the preferred side. And again, this isn't so bad if I get straight, uh, but I would have to either accept a very long shot on the eight, or I'm going to have to draw the ball back to the rail and back out again. Um, so again, ideally, I want to be a little bit on this side of the seven, or preferably a little bit on the high side of the seven. One thing to guard against on these shots is getting too close to the rail because then you have a back cut on the seven, the cue ball wants to run, and it's going to be very tough to get on the eight. So trying to get up there on the seven, I'm going to kind of play for the second diamond um, line right there. Okay, so I have just enough angle to be able to come down toward the eight a little bit. And get on the inside of it. And then from here, I would probably just follow underneath the nine as opposed to trying to stun over just a little bit easier shot. And I would accept the, the longer shot and playing on the short side of the nine just for the simplicity of not having to come across. So let's run that one more time. And the good thing about something like this, you can even take this exact position yourself, but um, that there's value in doing this, you know, three, five, ten times in practicing like a specific position of a three or four ball run like this just to get the consistency and really hone those patterns and speeds uh, into your muscle memory. You can see now I hit that one just a little softer. Now I've got the other angle on the seven. So I can hit this with inside English and float down either to this area or that area, or I can hit a more natural uh, draw shot with a little bit of outside English and come into the zone kind of this way. So that's what I'm going to do. Put some draw on it and a little bit of English. And you can see by doing it that way, I'm coming kind of right down the zone. Okay. So I kind of was in no man's land there for a little bit, but I got nice and close to the eight, which gives me options as far as playing position. Okay. Now I can just kind of float over and take a reasonable shot on the nine. So set yourself up, you know, a couple of three or four ball patterns and, and run them a couple of times and get used to the speed and build up that muscle memory, build up that instinct for where you need to be and start visualizing some of these zones. Um, and, and like I said, when I'm playing, it's not so much that I'm consciously kind of drawing the triangles, but when I was learning, I certainly spent time kind of really strongly visualizing um, those shapes. So this is a concept that's really important and this is going to be I chose to represent it as a square. It's basically probably about a 12 to 16 inch square in the middle of the table. And that's a really good place to be. So being in the center of the table or on the center lines, either the vertical center line or the horizontal center line going across the side pocket, those are really important areas to learn to get to. Uh, it comes up all the time. So. had a couple of positions here. It really doesn't matter. Again, you could interchange these balls and play around with this with, uh, with different patterns. But you can see if I start here with the one ball, I can make the two, the three, and the four all from center table. Now I may want to be a little bit closer perhaps or a little less angle ideally, but 
I have a shot like this, and I'm thinking about getting on the two, if I know that I hit center table and that gives me an angle and it gets me reasonably close, then that this gives me like a big zone for me to try to get into. And I've had some exercises like this in the past and they're on my website that um, show you some of the common position routes and how to get back to center table. So again, from here, getting back to center table would be fine. I could draw the ball back but it's just as easy to follow it and put just maybe a hair of right English on the ball. Okay, so again, I'm coming back through that center, center part of the table. And now I've got an ideal angle on the three. So again, I wanna pull that cue ball back and I can pull it right back through the center of the table again. Okay. Again, if I had the ability to go all the way over to the rail, if this was my final ball, that's what I would do. I would hit that a little harder, but I would come through the center of the table still and just land over on the rail just to give myself an easy shot on the final ball. But for normal position play, this is what I want. I want this like 15, 10, 15, 20 degree angle on the balls all the time and be about two to three feet away. And uh, there are times where you want to be straight in. So for instance, if you're playing a sequence, four ball is here, five ball is here. Well, I really don't want a 20 degree angle on this shot because I may have to go back and forth across the table or come to the short side of the five. So on a shot like this, I'm going to know that in my run and I'm going to play to get fairly straight in. Now, I may not want to be exactly straight in, but you know, something like this, Right, that may be okay, and I may be able to just hit that stop shot and have my 20 degree angle on the next shot for me to get to the six ball, let's say. So, center of the table is a key position, and I showed this in a previous clinic, but having shots along the rail like this and just practicing with a little bit of angle to the speed and everything that you need to get back toward the center of the table. having the same shot. And again, you can just vary the angles for yourself and practice the same shot maybe, you know, five, 10 times and then change the angle a little bit. So from here, you know, being able to, to put the, enough follow and enough inside English on it to be able to come to the center of the table. Right? So something like that. Something similar could be on this side using low outside instead, right? So you have to be able to shoot all of those shots depending on where interfering balls might be, depending on the angles you're trying to uh, maintain, things like that. So getting back to the center of the table from a wide variety of positions is very important. wanted to show real quick I'm only going to set up uh, one side of this As you can see there's 16 positions on the table this is actually a drill that the billiard brothers published and executed so if you want to look for it on YouTube just google the billiard billiard brothers channel on YouTube and uh, they have a lot of drills on there many of them are very difficult and the guys that are doing them uh, the Russian team over there, uh, Ruslan Chinnikov and Fedor Gorst and um, a few others. They, uh, there's some, uh, Maxim Dudonets is another one. They're very difficult drills, and it's, uh, it's pretty cool to actually watch them execute the drills. So you can see, again, I've got a square here in the center of the table. And I think when he does this drill, he actually has an outline on the table to be able to see where he needs to get. And the goal is to basically shoot. Uh, 16 balls, so there'll be eight on this side and eight on this side. So when you shoot the first ball, you basically respot it on the position, so you end up with 16 instead of 15. And the goal is to make all 16 balls and get back to the center of the table on every single shot. Very difficult. I can show you just a quick sample, maybe. Uh, you start with this ball usually. Okay. 
Okay, so I got back to the center, so that was good. Now I've got to get back to the center from the nine, typically. So I have to kind of slow spin this a little bit or come back and forth across the table. Okay, so pretty close. Again, you see how tough it is to really get exactly to the center. So then what I see them do is a lot of times they'll take these balls on the rail. And, and again, this is be two rail shape back toward the center. And then from here, same thing. And that shot's a little more difficult with it being frozen. And I find, to me, doing the drill, if you watch them do this, these balls that are on the second diamond are, uh, are the toughest, just because of the angle and the speed that's needed and having to come back twice. Yeah. See, it's it's tough. You have to like try to get right here, like on this side of the zone, if you can. And then once you get all the tough shots done, the ones that are on the outside here are actually a little bit easier, and uh, you end up pretty much hitting these with follow and a little bit of inside English. And you can see that for those, you know, you can use just enough inside English to come back up the center of the table. Okay, so you can see those are a little bit more, more repetitive, but um, definitely go to their YouTube channel and check it out. I mean, this drill alone is pretty impressive when you, I forget who did it, but if you watch them do it, it's pretty impressive. And they have dozens on there that, uh, like I said, are very, very difficult and uh, pretty impressive to watch the level of cue ball control. Okay, so this is also an important concept and uh, I don't really know what to call it necessarily. It's kind of a semicircle zone that goes between the first and third diamonds on each end of the table and kind of extends upward about a diamond. Uh, so I always think of this, it kind of looks like the, like uh, what's in front of a soccer goal or, a, or an ice hockey goal or kind of the top of the free throw lane in, in basketball. So this zone is very important for two reasons. One, for safety play, defense play, and two, for um, position zone. So I want to kind of go over a little bit of each of those. So when you're playing safe, having the cue ball in one of these zones is good, but having the object ball in one of these zones is really the key. So if I can leave if I can play safe on this ball and leave it in this zone, almost no matter where I put the cue ball, I'm going to at least leave a very difficult shot or, or not any kind of realistic shot at all. So let me show you. I, I won't even try to hit the cue ball anywhere special. Right? I didn't even pay attention to my cue ball. And I'm not going to give up a shot on the three. Now again, could someone bank it? Possibly. You know, there might be other balls on the table as well. but. I'm, what I don't want to do is I don't want this ball to leak out over to here because then if my cue ball is, say, here, it gives somebody a cut on the ball. And I don't want to get it too far out this way in the middle because, again, it leaves somebody a reasonable cut on the ball. But if I put it down in here, yeah, it's cuttable, but it's very difficult and the cue ball is going to run pretty, pretty far. So most people then would have to be, would be forced to play a return safe. Now, if you're able based on the position of the balls, to play a safe where you can leave both balls in the zones, that would be ideal. So let me see if I can show you what that would look like. Okay, so I left the cue ball almost frozen to this rail. Anytime you can get really close to the rail with the cue ball, it's good. It takes options away from your opponent. They can only hit the top side of the ball, plus the cueing sometimes a little more difficult. 
So that would be a great safety, even if there were no other balls on the table, leaving both balls end to end like this in this semicircle zone. So another safety would be kind of a crossover safety. Something like this. And again, I'm not too worried about the cue ball in this case, but I'm trying to send that three ball down to the end rail and back up to this end rail in this zone. So my speed has to be pretty good. I don't want to hit it too soft and leave it out here. And I don't want to hit it so hard that it hits the rail and goes back out again too far out. Okay, so that's pretty good. It's gonna be at the tip of the zone. And again, a, a good shot maker might go ahead and take a swing at that ball, but it's, it's a low percentage shot and I'm okay with that. One good tip when you're hitting end-to-end -end safeties like this, a lot of times you're hitting that, the object ball pretty full and it can be hard to kind of estimate the speed you need to get it in this zone. And so one thing I try to think about is if I'm hitting that ball pretty full, most of the energy from the cue ball is gonna be transferred to the object ball. So I really just wanna hit the cue ball with a speed that makes me feel like I'm just hitting the cue ball up to this part of the table. So it's almost like a lag type shot, right? If I was here and I hit the ball with about that speed, it's gonna land in that zone, right? It's got good speed. So when I hit this three ball, I can really just kind of focus on that same speed. And I actually hit that one just a little bit hard and a little bit to the, to the right over here. Now again, if I was playing in a match, I'm gonna take my time and, and aim everything really precisely and, and possibly try to do something with the cue ball. I just want to show you, if I, if I just hit that cue ball the same way from a speed perspective, that's really all you have to think about is just think about your cue ball if you're hitting the object ball pretty full. Now, certainly if you're cutting the ball, you're going to need to do something different with the speed. But if you're hitting it pretty full in the face, it's nice. And especially when the ball's down here, it can be difficult sometimes to feel that speed. So as long as you're cutting across it enough to where you're not going to double kiss it, just do that same thing. Just feel like you're going to just hit the cue ball. And you'll have a good speed to get it up to the end of the table. Another thing I really like about these zones, technically these same zones exist on the side rails as well. As well. So if you're ever playing these kind of safeties and you can't do the end-to-end -end safety for whatever reason, you know, thinking about getting into those side zones is also beneficial, right? So if I picture this, I've got my little semicircle here and another one over there. Now you are gonna leave a, typically a side rail bank or possibly a cross corner bank depending on the orientation of the balls. So it is more makeable than the lengthwise version but again, sometimes that's all you have and there, and there may not even be any interfering balls, but it's kind of a, um, just kind of a safety where you're just trying to prolong things a little bit and maybe, maybe it's the only shot that you had. So that's really talking about these semicircle zones from a defensive position. From an offensive position, they're also very useful. So I've heard a lot of people talk about uh, when they're on the nine ball, what do they do with the cue ball? And, I, and I've heard people say, well, you should play shape for an imaginary ball on the nine ball so that it helps you stay focused on your stroke and um, not scratch. Uh, some people, when they're shooting the, the nine or the eight in a, in, in a game, they're only focused on not scratching. Uh, a lot of times people kind of baby the ball because they want to try to ease the ball into the hole and again, they're worried about scratching. So when I kind of thought about this concept, a lot of times you're really trying to hit the, 
put the cue ball in one of these zones when you're playing when you're playing the nine ball. And I don't necessarily think about putting the cue ball exactly in that zone. I just know that that's a safe place to be. Now, if I get here on the nine like this and I'm straight in, obviously I'm just going to hit a stop shot and stop the ball. If I have a slight angle like this, again, there's really no reason for me to hit the typical two rail shot you see people hit or anything like that. I'm just going to sit here like this and just, you know, roll the ball in, right? There's no reason to do anything extra. But if I have a little bit of angle like this, if you can think about this, there's a couple different ways to get to this safe area when shooting this shot. So one way would be just to hit follow, possibly just a hair of, of inside English, and uh, hit it with a nice firm stroke so that you're not babying the ball, you're not worried about any kind of collision induced throw and things like that, but still send the cue ball to a safe location. So if I, if I saw a shot like this, I might hit it with follow and just a hair of right English. Right, and I'm going to send my cue ball up table in the direction of this zone. Now I don't care if I get in this zone, so I'm not trying to play safe, but I'm coming toward that zone in a safe manner, taking these other pockets out of play. Another common shot that you see players do all the time, still have a shot like this, and they'll play the nine ball pretty firm, a little bit of low, maybe a little bit of outside English, depending on, on the player's preference and the exact position on the balls. And you see them all the time. They come two rails out of the corner. Well, once they hit these two corners, where's the ball going? It's going across the table to here and back down there. Now, again, I may not always hit the ball firm enough to actually get in the zone, but it's targeting that zone if I were to hit it a little harder. So again, let's say I hit this shot. I might just hit it at this speed, right? It avoids a scratch. I'm not coming anywhere near the side pocket and I can hit it a little firmer, make sure that you know the ball doesn't roll off or I get a skid or anything like that. So let me just hit the shot harder. And again, I would not hit the shot this hard in a match, but let me just do the same shot and show you if I extend the line, what's gonna happen with the cue ball. Right? It's coming right into my right into my preferred zone. Another good example of this. Nine ball tends to stay around the rack area. And so a lot of times, depending on where the eight ball is, you may find yourself coming down table two rails or three rails for position, or even one rail, and you may come up a little bit a little bit short. So players tend to have these kinds of shots fairly frequently and I definitely um, in previous clinics I've advised people to practice these types of shots so they get comfortable with them because they do come up pretty often both these shots and kind of what I call these 50 yard line shots when you're <clears throat> when you came maybe too far for position and now you've got to cut the ball backwards so with both shots this position still holds true so from here what I do most of these angles, I, I'm pretty okay just to hit a naturally rolling ball, no English, no anything, and I just want to come back up towards the spot. So this is going to be straight follow. Okay. So again, where's the cue ball going? It's coming up toward the end of the end of the table, right into my zone. I may need to have a little bit of English depending on my exact location. But again, I find that I can hit the ball with the speed and, and everything to get back up to that, to that zone. So I'll do one more example, say from here. Okay, so same thing. So I'm avoiding all the scratches and coming right into this perfect zone. If I have a little kind of 50 yard line shot, it's going to be very similar. I'm going to hit this shot, I'm going to come across the table, and my cue ball is going to kind of land in that same area. Okay. 
So when I'm playing in a, in a, in a game, I, I don't necessarily think about getting into this zone. It's kind of somewhat automatic. And I don't really care if I land a little short of the zone or if I come through the zone and land a little beyond the zone. But when you stop to think about it, that target area is a really great area to think about when you're playing on your final ball. Now, again, when you're playing eight balls, sometimes there's other balls on the table. You may not want the cue ball to run quite that far on the table. But when you're playing nine ball, you hit that with a nice, you know, medium speed stroke. A lot of times you'll find that your cue ball will be tracking toward one of these two semicircle zones. So something to keep in mind, especially if you find yourself having issues with scratching on the game ball or worrying about scratching on the, on the game ball. The last thing I want to cover just real quickly, and I covered this in my angle rule lesson, but because this provided a nice shape and had kind of a square with the line and the two triangles, I wanted to cover it again. So this was the 45 degree rule. And that basically says if you're shooting a ball and you're cutting at 45 degrees, the cue ball is going to travel uh, approximately one diamond for every half table that it travels. So in this case, if I'm shooting one lengthwise down the table, it should, I'm on the second diamond, it should travel two diamonds forward and come close to scratching in the corner pocket. And you can visualize that 45 degree angle, again, based on kind of visualizing this square, go up one diamond and over one diamond, or go up two diamonds and over two diamonds, and that's your 45 degree angle. So from here, I should come pretty close to scratching the naturally rolling cue ball. Okay, so that's pretty close. And then if you're shooting it across the table, Again, this is a little wider example. So again, to visualize that 45 degree angle, you come two diamonds up and two diamonds over. So this shot, again, since it's gonna travel one diamond, I should, again, come pretty close to scratching in the corner. Okay, so you know when you're on that angle and you're that distance away, it's going to be close, so you have to make sure you use a little bit of outside English, maybe a little inside English, maybe a little draw or whatever to avoid that scratch. And again, I covered that a little bit last time as well. So, okay, I think that's it for for the shape class that I wanted to cover today. If you have any questions, feel free to uh, comment on the Facebook page or on the YouTube channel, and I will get back to you and answer your comments and appreciate it. And uh, be here next month with the next clinic. Thank you.